Okay, well, this is part two of our innovation series. So given that we have already discussed uh, what innovation is and how do we actually create new markets and what kind of strategies are behind that, let's talk a little bit about how we actually manage innovation. Uh, let me start by saying that innovation, in a way, it's a necessary evil in the capitalistic system. Why do I say necessary evil? I think, uh, I think honestly, innovation is the single most important source of improving the lives of pretty much everybody in in the planet. Uh, because of the innovation, uh, we have products and services that have made our lives a lot better, and they have also increased our quality of life. However, innovation is a very risky endeavor. It's risky in two ways. One is most new products fail. When I say products, I mean services or anything else. Um, so most new products fail, uh, upwards of 90%. It really depends how you measure it and what you mean by failing. Do you mean by failing uh, not being in the market within a year? Or do you mean by failing not hitting the target uh, revenue measures within a year? And if it's the second, it's definitely upwards of 90%. And so innovation is risky. It's also risky if you don't innovate. In fact, if you don't innovate in your industry, you probably will disappear as a company. So you have no choice but to go forward with it. Now, because it's because of the risk that I was alluding to before, uh, companies have created processes in place that try to minimize the chances of introducing a, comp a product or a service that is going to fail in the marketplace. The most widely implemented and probably studied process for introducing new products is the stage gate development process. So let me walk you through it. And there are some valuable lessons to be learned from it. And, and it does have some limitations like everything else. So the idea of a stage gate process is to break down the process of development of the product into little projects so that you can have up and down boards of to whether that project is going to be canceled at multiple places to ensure that the product that comes out at the end is indeed one that has a good chance of being successful in the marketplace. And as you can see over here, there are these uh, stages and gates that uh, basically break down the new product development process into different parts. So it starts with ideation. So you'll come up with techniques that are used for brainstorming or coming up with ideas, and there are many on this in the literature. And then after that, after you have a large number of ideas, what you will do is you will have some sort of initial screening. So you'll have a set of people, uh, oftentimes these are formed by cross functional teams that include people from engineering, people from marketing, and people from operations that have a good understanding about the business that uh, is trying to develop the new product. And based on that, it's going to have a set of criteria that is gonna determine whether these new ideas are gonna move forth into the following uh, stage process, which will be uh, feasibility, right? So before uh, you actually move into the feasibility study, what you're going to do is you're going to determine which ideas are going to move forward. Okay. And so the idea behind this is you go from stage to stage to stage, and in between there are going to be multiple gates where there's going to have to be a vote up or down with some key decision makers that are going to determine whether the project is worthwhile to uh, keep moving forward into the following stage. Okay, And you can see it goes from uh, ideation to uh, doing some preliminary investigation to see whether the idea is feasible. Then you will develop a business case. Okay? Business case is basically looking at uh, whether there is a way in which we could actually make money with the particular product or service, and if so, how the business model will look like. Uh, after this, there will be another gate, so we will decide whether we keep moving forward or not. Uh, if we've decided that indeed it's worthwhile, then you will move into the product 
design and development stage and here there may be multiple iterations where you go uh, through multiple prototype evaluations and prototype designs uh, until you are comfortable that the product or service is at a good enough spot where you can move into the following stage which is uh, testing and validation and you will iterate between these two until uh, the product sufficiently um, close to what will be acceptable uh, in the marketplace okay and then after this set of iterations uh, has uh, basically provided a prototype that is sufficient so it's, it's in a sufficiently good state to actually move to the market you will move into the production and uh, market uh, readiness stage where you are going to develop not only the product aspect but also uh, any communication aspects like advertising uh, you will also develop any connections that need to be set up for the distribution of the product if you need to, to trade etc uh, and set up the contracts that will enable you to get the product into the right places in the market and then after all this is done you might actually have another stage which is not here where you do some market testing to see whether indeed all the work that you've done both on the product development side and maybe all the collateral that comes with the product in terms of marketing materials is actually in the up to snuff okay as you can see this is a long process that follows in one direction for the most part there might be some loops in here like i've mentioned between testing and development but there is mostly no feedback loops except for this stage and it's pretty sequential okay let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of this process now <clears throat> this stage gate process has some advantages and uh, one of the key advantages is that because oftentimes the teams that are formed uh, to create this product development process and also at the different uh, gates and they are usually comprised of people from different parts of the organization they actually do improve quite a bit cross-functional communication within the firm and it also helps make sure that we keep eyes on the target by defining clearly what the projects are and uh, what direction we want to move the company forward and the number one advantage is that it probably uh, improves quite a bit the execution at each of the different stages so uh, it really makes sure that we are being uh, effective and moving things through this uh, go no go process um, and it has clear uh, process structure there is a clear indication of who's going to make the decisions and there is no ambiguity about what needs to happen before the product actually hits the market Okay. so because of that it's probably the most commonly used mark, uh, project what you're essentially doing uh, even though it's not on the slide is you're trying to minimize the chances of launching a product that is in fact a failure so you're trying to minimize uh, if you're thinking at it from a stats perspective type one error um, now this has a caveat which is as you're minimizing the launching products that are not going to be doing well in the marketplace you're going to prevent products that will actually do well in the marketplace not coming through right so there's a trade-off as we will see in the next slide okay what are the downsides of of the model of the stage gate model of new product development well the number one downside is that it's a very linear process right except for this loop that i was alluding to between development and testing for the most part you need to go through each of the stages it's a very bureaucratic system that everything is laid out and is somewhat rigid right so this uh, doesn't add a lot of flexibility to the product development stage and if things are changing in the marketplace it's going to be hard uh, for us to react quickly when we have a process like this the second difficulty is that uh, this process is the same regardless of whether the new product that you are developing or new service is very similar to the existing products or quite a bit different if it's a radical innovation or an incremental innovation and this doesn't really make sense because uh, from the strategic perspective we know that products that are essentially incremental uh, innovations and um, we're going to be pretty sure about what's going to happen within in the marketplace 
So there is not a lot of risk associated with it. And because of that, they probably don't need to go through such an elaborate and convoluted system to try to minimize the chance of something that we know that it's slow to begin with. Okay. And another difficulty of the process is that it doesn't tell you anything about how resources should be allocated across projects. The only thing that it tells you is what each project needs to do to be successful. So from a management perspective, it doesn't give you the tools so that you can actually allocate resources efficiently. Okay. Okay. Now. What will be a more appropriate way of looking at uh, projects of uh, new product development within the organization? Well, these slides try to capture some of the insights about uh, options management, where you try to remain more flexible instead of having this very rigid go-no-go -go set of gates uh, and small steps in the process. So let me try to discuss this diagram and explain what it means. Um, so what this is trying to do is it's trying to have track how people how expenses and risks change over time. So what's happening over here is as the arrow moves towards the right, time is increasing, right? So in the beginning, where time is zero, right here. Right. What happens is we barely started with the project, so we are in the ideation stage, right? And at this step, we have barely spent any money. You can see that spend rate, which is right here, it's pretty low. That green curve is close to the axis where the zero is, right? So we haven't spent a lot of money. We just coming up with ideas. So at this point, we haven't spent a lot of money. But what happens at this stage is that the risk or the knowledge that we have about each of those ideas is very high, right? So uncertainty is very high. Okay. Uncertainty is high. What we know about these ideas, it's pretty little. It's just a very uh, rudimentary idea at this stage, okay? Now, what happens over time as we move in our research and development stages through the product, what's going to happen is this uncertainty is going to drop. Why is it dropping? It's not dropping because time is passing by. It's dropping because we are doing research in the area and we're trying to learn more about what works, what doesn't, what kind of technologies can be used to achieve the kind of outcomes that our customers are interested in, etc. Right? And at the same time, what is happening and is that all that research that we're doing is making our expenses go up, right? So learning a little bit in the beginning is quite cheap. Maybe you can do just simple searches online and learn quite a bit. But if you want to do a more refined research, it's going to require you to collect data, build prototypes, and that's expensive. So you're going to see how the spend rate is going to go up over time. Now notice, as one goes up, the other one goes down. So what I have here is the product between the two curves, the yellow curve, sorry, yellow curve, the green curve, and uh, the purple curve, which are the spend rate, the amount of money that you're spending uh, in a given time, and the amount of uncertainty that we have. And that uh, product of those two terms is given by the convolution that you have there in red with the dashed line. And that's business risk. Notice business risk is the product of the investment times the uncertainty. If you have a lot of uncertainty and the investment small, uh, the risk is still low, right? So in the beginning, even though we barely know anything, risk is low because we are spending so little money, okay? But as we're spending more money, even though uncertainty is dropping, risk is going up. You can see risk is the highest right here in the middle. Okay, because at that point we have spent quite a bit and we still have reasonably high uncertainty, at least moderate uncertainty. As you spend more and more money, you move towards the end of this diagram. What you see is you're spending a lot of money, so you spent a lot, but the risk is ameliorated quite considerably. You can see that red line here. It's quite a bit low because your uncertainty has dropped so much. So all that research that you have done really enables you to understand better the marketplace. And now you know whether things are going to work or not and what exactly works. So because of that, the risk over here is low, okay, towards the end of the spectrum, that red line 
it's going down. So what this diagram is showing you is that you need to basically manage the risk of failure, not the cost of failure. So what do I mean by that? Uh, you should fail often, but fail cheaply. Okay. So try many things early on, see what sticks. It's okay to have a lot of projects that are canceled so long as those projects are inexpensive. So if you have a good idea, you do a little bit of simple testing and you see that it's not going to work, whether because of market factors, technology factors, any reason for it, right? And move on quickly. That's how we learn a lot and how you manage this process. What you don't want to do is you don't want to just kill a lot of projects after you spend a lot of money. So by the time you're spending large amounts of money, you should be pretty certain that the project is worthwhile. So you're going to take different approaches uh, in how you actually manage this process. So early on, what you're going to do is you're going to use options management, which is this idea of staying flexible by uh, looking at these projects as possibilities, right? So this idea of filling uh, cheaply and often, right? Then after that, you're going to move to discovery-driven planning. Right? So what you're doing is you're trying to do market experimentation and see whether the assumptions that you have made about the market conditions and your consumers actually hold true and your business model is going to be uh, reasonably good to be uh, sustainable over time. And then finally, what you're going to be is at the late stages, uh, you're going to be making sure that whatever you come up with is indeed valuable for the customer. So you're going to have to focus quite a bit on what your value proposition is in the marketplace. Okay. So we're going to use the different approaches for looking at the same project depending on what you are within the time frame that I'm describing over here. So and after we've talked about how to manage our new product development process, let's talk a little bit about how these new products, these new services, these new offerings, these innovations are going to spread in the marketplace. How are people going to go ahead and adopt these new products that are exciting to us as a company? And for that, we're going to try to look at the literature and see uh, how do people, what is the process that people follow uh, until they actually adopt a new product? And most consumers will go through a set of stages from the moment that they become aware that that product exists until they actually go ahead and adopt it, meaning buy it. Okay. And usually the stages tend to be like this. First, you need to hear about it. So that will be awareness. Then you become somewhat interested in the product because maybe the added benefits, features, or uh, any other aspect of the product, uh, it actually aligns with what your preferences are. And then you're going to do some sort of evaluation, okay, which may be aided by trial. Some products and services can be tried before they are bought. Uh, this can be applied to anything. It doesn't matter whether it's a product or not. For example, you can see this with movies, right? Movies are something that uh, have usually pretty short lifespans. So if you look at box office metrics, most movies are at the box office for less than 10 weeks, okay? Maybe 12 weeks if they are particularly successful. And uh, so because of that, these are products, new products that have a very short lifespan. And uh, so triability is, guys, we're going to see is going to be important. So if you can actually try the movie before you buy it, because going to the movies, it's not that inexpensive anymore. And so that will actually enhance your chances that you'll move forward. And how you do this? Well, you have the trailer, right? That at least give you a glimpse, gives you a glimpse uh, about the movie, some sort of idea, so that you can just make a decision as to whether it actually matches with your preferences or not. And finally, you're just going to decide to either adopt it or not based on all the information in your evaluation and trial. Okay. Now, having said what the process is, what are the factors that determine whether you are likely to adopt it or not? Uh, well, it depends on the type of uh, innovation that you're talking about. If you're talking about a new product that has a lot of good benefits, 
and then you're going to be more likely to adopt it. So let me just break down what kind of characteristics the innovation had to have in order to be more readily adopted by consumers in the marketplace. The first one is observability. This means that the actual benefit that is provided by the product or service is clear and visible to for everybody to see. So let me give you an example of something that uh, could actually potentially be difficult to ascertain up front. Something is not very observable. This is what happened with high definition TVs, for example, originally, right? When you have a small screen, uh, traditional TVs were made uh, out of glass uh, using a technology called CRT, which stands for cathodic ray tube. And what happened with these TVs is when their screen size will go past 30 inches, uh, the glass needed to be so thick for the vacuum that needed to be in place inside of the TV for the electrons to be able to travel and the image to be created, uh, that the TV will become heavier and heavier and heavier. So 30 inch screens that use CRT technology were about 200 pounds. Uh, and anything bigger than that was uh, uh, not in the marketplace for the most part. I think the largest CRT TVs that were on sale were 32 inches because they became so extremely heavy that nobody will actually buy the TVs. Right now, this imposed a limitation because a 30 inch screen, it's rather small for high definition television to become obvious. Okay, what happens with our human eyes is that uh, a TV that is high definition, if it's placed far apart from us and it's small enough in screen, which is what was happening because of the restrictions of the CRT technology, you could not see the difference between high definition and standard definition. So observability was limited because of the restrictions in technology um, by the the nature of how TVs were put together. And once that we stop uh, using CRT technology and we move to other technologies such as plasma or LCD uh, screens, suddenly the market can open up because TVs could become a lot bigger than 30 inches. And now if you go to a, a store to buy a TV, you'll see easily TVs in the 60, 70 inch range, which were not feasible before. Uh, then high definition actually makes sense because it's a lot more observable, right? So meaning that the customer can tell the difference between high definition source and a standard definition source. Okay, relative advantage is how much better relative to the existing technology than your technology is. Right? And this could be measured along any performance metric. So if you are launching, for example, a new technology that enables you to uh, move data faster, this is true, for example, with 5G networks that are being implemented as we speak right now in the US and other developed economies. How much faster is 5G compared to 4G LTE, which is the current technology right now? This is what's going to tell you what the relative advantage of that new innovation is. Okay. And usually what happens is when the order of improvement is not at least an order of magnitude or higher, most customers cannot tell the difference. So if you buy a computer that is 10% or 20% faster than an existing computer, uh, you probably will not be able to tell the difference much. Uh, if it's an order of magnitude, which is 100% uh, faster, uh, then you're definitely going to be able to start noticing the difference. But there are diminishing marginal returns here, like always. Okay. Then you have compatibility, which is uh, whether you can use your past uh, assets, your existing assets with the new technology. This is particularly important in things like video games, right? When a new uh, um, Xbox system is launched by Microsoft at the end of this year, unless the coronavirus derails their effort, that's their plan state for the new introduction of a new system. Um, What's going to happen is unless you can use your old video games, meaning unless your old video games are compatible with your existing uh, hardware, the one, the new hardware that you're going to buy, what's going to happen is your attractiveness for buying that product is going to go down because compatibility makes it a lot easier for you to be able to use your old games without having to be maintaining or keeping two systems within. Uh, uh, your household. By the way, if you have a wife, you, you will know that uh, having only one system is a lot neater, and because of that, it's better than having two things, which 
if you are single and a guy, you might not care about having multiple devices around the house. But for the most part, it's inconvenient to have more than one device. So compatibility is something that makes uh, the rate of new product adoption higher because, of course, it's more convenient for people to be able to use your existing products and services within the new platform. And then we have triability, which is whether you can uh, break down the product or service into smaller increments and because of that, give it a shot before you actually buy it. I already talked about movies and trailers. It's just an example of this. And finally, have complexity. The more complex the new product or services, the harder it is to understand by consumers where the value added is. And because of that, it's going to be less likely to be adopted uh, in the marketplace. Now, here you have the sales for three different generations of systems that are used for music delivery uh, by consumers. Okay, you have here LP albums, and you have cassettes, and you have sales for CDs, compact disc. That's what CD stands for. I'm assuming you know this. I don't have data for other things like streaming or MP3 sales, but you will see a similar curve like you see in these ones. And the curves, they they overlap. These are new technologies that have arised over time. But let me show you how the curves of each of these new products look in the marketplace. Okay, they look like this. Uh, this is uh, the S curve. Okay, uh, and what this is telling you is that over time, when you look at product category, by the way, this is not for individual brands. This is for the entire product category. So this will be for all TVs, all color TVs, for example, or for all CD players. Right, sales look like this. Here you have the sales volume, right, and here you have time. And you can see as it time goes up, you can see how this uh, sales, if the product successful, it's going to ramp up really quickly. And eventually, when the industry becomes mature, it will reach a peak sales and start coming down. Okay, and this um, this shape, it's something that occurs over and over and over again. I just showed you in the previous slide how it happened in the same industry with three different technologies and it's repeating over and over again and it will continue to do so over time if you track sales and time. So this is a very common pattern. So we're going to use this pattern to try to predict how this process is going to happen in the marketplace. So what I'm going to show you guys is a model that enables you to predict what's going to happen in the practice place. By the way, side note, uh, this model actually comes from biology originally. And because in biology, you observe the same curve in when you look at species and how species grow uh, in a given uh, environment. And the same thing can actually be used, uh, and it is used right now, uh, to predict uh, the number of people that get sick with a virus. Uh, a modification of the model that I'm going to do right now could actually be used, and it is used by a lot of, a lot of uh, people that study uh, viral infections uh, to try to predict what's going to happen with the infection over time. So let's move into the model. And the model that we're going to use to determine uh, when and to what extent products are going to be uh, acquired in the marketplace is called the BAS model. And this is because the professor that uh, published the paper a long time ago at this point, uh, his name was his name is Frank Bass. And Professor Bass proposed basically using this model that had a few features that make it flexible but simple enough to be useful and relatively easy to understand. So let's see if I can actually convey the key ideas. So there are two types of people in this model. There are innovators. There are people that are usually very interested in the product category and they may uh, be able to be influenced by maybe uh, advertising, but they don't care about what other people are doing. They just want to hear what the benefits of the product are and based on that, they will make a decision themselves. And then you have imitators. Now, imitators are different than innovators because their decisions are a function of not what they hear from advertising, but what they see in others, right? So it's going to be essentially a matter of word of mouth. Do they hear good things from others or do they not? And if they do, they will actually go ahead and try the product or buy the product in this case. Or if they don't hear the good things from others, then they will just move on and not go ahead and buy.
buy the product. Now, if you have these two types of people in the marketplace, then what we're going to make is we're going to make a series of assumptions to be able to predict what's going to happen. And to keep it simple, we're going to assume that the adoption rate in any given time is going to be a linear function. Why linear? Because it's simple. Of the total number of previous buyers. So the more people that have bought the product in the marketplace, the more likely it is that somebody will hear a good thing about the product and because of that, they will just be able to buy it. That's the assumption behind the model. Let me show you how the equations look like. In the model. Okay, so the BAS model, uh, it's essentially a differential equations model. Okay, and the key equation is this right, right here. Okay, right here. And what it does is it tells you what the sales are as a function of time. So this is a rate equation. So it's telling you how sales are changing over time. Okay, which is the curve that I showed you before that looks like an S, right? And how are we going to do this? We're going to capture it by looking at this innovators and imitators. So the coefficient of imitation uh, is going to be Q and the coefficient of innovation is going to be P. Right. So these two coefficients over here are going to capture the strength of these two effects that I was talking about. One is just the fact that some people are innovators and because of that they're going to jump in the marketplace. That's it. That's going to be captured by P right here. And the other effect that we're going to try to capture is captured by this Q, which is that as you hear people from others that have already adopted the, the product in the marketplace, you're going to go ahead and be more likely to adopt it. Now notice one thing, P is independent of other things and that independence is captured by not being multiplying by anything. But Q, the number of uh, imitators, is going to be a function of the number of people that did buy the product last term. Last term could be last year, last month, last whatever kind of data that you have. So let's say that you have yearly data, right? So y t minus 1 is the cumulative sales after the year t minus 1. So that's the number of people that have bought, the total number of people that have bought the product that you are selling up to the previous term, right? And those are the only people that can, according to this model, discuss and talk about the product and because of that influence these imitators, right? So your sales rate is going to be a function of these two effects that I was discussing, innovation and imitation. And then finally, what you have here left is the number of people that could actually potentially buy the product. And so this model assumes that there is a total population. So let's say in the United States, M, for example, if you're trying to describe and uh, what this M will be is that, for example, the total number of people that could buy a product. So in the U.S., let's say that it's a product that anybody could buy. So that will be 350 million people. Okay. And Y T minus one is the number of people that bought the product in total up to yesterday until the day, uh, the term before the one that we're in right now. So if T is in years, it will be until last year. So this difference here is the total number of potential people that could uh, buy the product. And this describes the probability that they will buy the product. And that's how you get your rate. And uh, like I was mentioning before, notice that you can apply the same thing for infections if you redefine this in terms of people that could get infected and their contact. Okay, so if you're interested in uh, trying to predict COVID-19, you can use a model similar to this, although this one is for marketing of products, to predict uh, the spread of the disease. And this is something that virologists will actually do on a regular basis. If you're interested in this, I suggest that you Google uh, SIR uh, models and you will see that the model actually is quite similar to this although they use different parameters but the story is the same okay good now what is the solution to this model let's look at the next slide for that so if you know differential equations which i don't expect you to know and uh, that linear model that i was alluding to before can actually be solved not every differential equation can be solved but this one has a solution a closed form solution which is nice it's one of the nice features of this model and the solution looks like this the solution tells you what the uh, cumulative rate 
of sales for a product is as a function of all our parameters. Notice here, M is a parameter, so I'm gonna draw in yellow things that are parameters here. M is a parameter, something that we potentially don't know. M is market potential, which is the total number of people that could potentially buy this product. It's something that we don't know. We're gonna estimate this from data, okay? Also notice that P and Q, we have them right here, are also data. Okay, sorry, data are unknown by us. So we're going to try to estimate them from data. Now, what are things that we know here? Okay, and I'm going to put those on red. We know one. Everybody knows what one is, right? No problem with that. We also know what E is. E is a number. It's 2.71, blah, 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 blah. Right? So it's an actual number. Okay, so don't be too scared by the E. Okay. And then T is just an index, right? That is going to take uh, different values depending on when you are within your prediction model, right? So this is an index for time. So T0, if you're interested in predicting, for example, how the number of Facebook accounts have grown over time, right? Uh, T will start when Facebook was founded, which I think it was 2004, right? And if that's the case, that's when you will make T equal to zero and then every year from there if you're interested in predicting the number of people that open a facebook account uh, t here will increase in uh, in 2005 will become one because at 2004 will be zero and on and on right and that's it there is no more parameters here notice that p and q repeat over here and over here and over here and over here right but they are the same p and the same q and we're gonna guess these numbers from the data, the way we're gonna guess them, I'm not gonna explain in class, it's using something called least squares, and there are other estimation methods. By the way, uh, one thing that I will do is I will make available to you, if you're interested, and this is definitely beyond the scope of class, uh, uh, Excel spreadsheet, let me know if you want it, where I can post that, uh, will give you a small data set, it's actually a real data set of cell phone adoption within the US. And it estimates P and Q for that data set using uh, Excel Solver. So if you're interested in that, it essentially estimates this very same equation over here. Uh, and it spits out the values of P, Q, and M for that data set. Uh, if you would like to have that capability, just let me know. I'll be happy to post it for you guys. Okay. Now, what are the ups and downs of this model? Uh, let me tell you a couple of things about the model. One is, uh, this is a very simple model. It was instituted uh, for the first time in around 19, uh, 1970, right? So this is not a new model, but there are literally thousands of papers that have refined this model and made it more complex and more accurate. Okay, so this is a good start, starting place. It's based on a solid set of assumptions but it's quite simple right although it might look complicated to you guys but it's indeed a simple model right so because of that there are many ways to basically make it better so let me discuss the assumptions of the model and some of the limitations and also tell you that a lot of these things can actually be improved upon and they have already been done by many uh, researchers. This model is used in industry all the time. Okay, maybe a more refined version of it, but uh, it's widely used. So first, let me start by saying it's one of the downside of it is that this model, it's for the whole industry, right? So you can estimate cell phone sales, but you cannot estimate iPhone sales very accurately with this. So it's for the whole industry, okay? This is just a limitation of what you're trying to measure, okay? And also, it only works well for predicting the first purchase. So if this is a product that you're going to buy on an ongoing basis, like some consumer package good that you buy every week or every month, this is not a model that is appropriate for that. This is when you're buying something that is durable and that you're not going to be buying over and over again, like a house or a car, etc., etc. okay? Uh, it also assumes that uh, as a marketer, you have no influence in the market potential. So M is fixed, which is something that arguably will not be the case in reality, because if you come up with a product that is particularly exciting, the potential market might actually expand. Okay. It also assumes that P and Q don't change over time. 
Okay. And again, this is arguably not necessarily reasonable. You will see that imitation will become stronger later on once that the product has been proven in the marketplace. But this is, makes the assumption that P and Q are constant because that makes estimation a lot easier. Okay, so it has a set of limiting assumptions. Um, now, it can, uh, it can give you a turning point, which is where that S curve starts going down. This is what everybody's wondering right now. If you listen to the president talking about the virus or any of the experts, that are advising him and uh, we're trying to predict when the peak of that curve is going to happen and predicting the peak is difficult okay it's easy to predict the increase but it's hard to predict when it's going to turn downwards okay and for that you need quite a bit of data and of course 10 or 12 years of data this is talking about sales of products when you have yearly data in the case of COVID-19 which can be predicted with a model similar to this and uh, you obviously will not uh, be looking at yearly data, you were looking literally at daily data, right? So you need multiple days before you can make a prediction about when the turn point is coming, okay? And it might be a lot more than 10 or 12 uh, days in this case, as you have seen by the data, okay? Uh, it is particularly useful when word of mouth plays an important role. By the way, when I say word of mouth, of course, uh, nowadays you can think about uh, reviews having a huge impact in uh, product decision making. So it's not just traditional word of mouth, but digital word of mouth will also be the case. Um, but the neat thing about it is we have so much uh, data on these kind of models that you can use existing studies to try to predict what's gonna happen with new products. Let me show some data on that. So here you have for historical products that you know maybe are not new and exciting right now, but uh, have certain characteristics that you can use. These are P's and Q's that have been estimated in the literature by researchers like me, right? And so this is based on true data. And what you can do is you can play with the model. If you have a new product that you're gonna introduce for which you have no data, you can just think about in terms of all these products that you have right here, whether any of them have similar characteristics to the one that you're introducing, even if the technology is different, and then run with the P and Q that you find here and try to estimate uh, when sales for your product will be sufficiently high for you to actually uh, make decisions about introduction of the product, et cetera, et cetera.